here. <laughs>
sure apologies to President Kirsten. Uh, she was attending to the family matter this morning. But um, she sent me, and I'm very thankful to be here. Um, what our communities and our residents appreciate everything that the task force is doing for the program. Thank you. As you know, uh, obviously last year was a uh, active weather year for us. Parish was hit two times within six months with flooding, and particularly on the west side of our parish. We have a very large uh, watershed, which is Bunker Basin, and that, that basin experienced severe flooding two times within six months. So many of the uh, victims of the floods last year were uh, hit twice in, within six, six months. And, um, also on the east side of the parish in our Pearl River Basin, which is an area that experiences not only uh, severe weather events on a regular basis, but also just regular flooding and hot water um, because of the nature of um, the hydrology there. Um, they were hit also, particularly in the March events. So um, we had a, uh, in the March event, we had a, uh, a strike on the west and then so later, it's right on the east. So it was a it was a challenge because this is a very large parish as far as um, it's over 900 square miles. And so as parish government, um, it was a challenge to respond um, at the time of the flooding. And as um, Madam Chair pointed out, with uh, 678 surveys still yet to be filled out, on the recovery, the recovery side, it's also a challenge. Um, while our residents are very resilient, like to um, like to pride themselves on being able to take care of themselves. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse um, for us as parish government because um, yes, they are trying to take care of themselves and come back, but it's hard to reach out. And uh, particularly on the west side of the parish, where we in recent history not had um, flooding events of this magnitude. Um, as the, the communities are spread out, it's quite rural, and so there is a challenge. And, and we want to, I want to particularly uh, inform the, the task force that through the program, we have had um, opportunities to try and find different ways to reach out to these folks. Um, we've had several meetings. Right. 
South Dakota City. And with the type of rains that, that we received north of Covington, even north of St. Tammany Parish, that came down through the tributaries and the watershed that feed into the rivers that go through our city, it caused flooding in areas that I had never seen before as a lifelong resident of, of Covington. There were areas along the rivers, but there were also areas in that received water because the water was not able to receive as quick as it normally does due to the nature of the, um, the southern winds that push back uh, into Lake Pontchartrain and push the waters uh, back north and, keeps, and, and, and prevents the water from, from receding. We had areas with flood zone C, located in flood zone C, that flood. And we'll, people were wondering why they, did they not have flood insurance? Why were they not encouraged to have flood insurance? Well, of course, we encourage everybody to, to get flood insurance, particularly what we've seen over the past five years, uh, the number of uh, rain events that we have, in, not only in our community and our parish, but around the state and around the nation. So, of those structures, about 150 received renovation permits uh, in our city. And you might want to wire only 150. We actually waived fees for any permits, but we requested and followed up with issuing permits so that we had a record of those homes that received damage. There are no active flood renovations at this time. And at the urging of the governor's office, in June of this year, we, we uh, uh, drafted a letter and sent out the, uh, the Restore Weekend flyer to those names that were given to us to remind them to participate in this program. And we also use social media as well. And I have a feeling that when I get back to the office today, I'm going to put this back on our website and social media to, uh, to remind those, again, who may not have participated. In closing, I'd like to say thank you for, for what you all are doing uh, in, in drawing attention to St. Tammany Parish and to help encourage our citizens to apply. Uh, but I'd like to note that, that we have applied for and received a community resiliency grant in the amount of $45,000 through NOAA and the Gulf of Mexico Alliance to develop a flood preparation and response plan for our citizens. The city will streamline its operations immediately preceding and during a flooding event and provide our citizens with enough time to protect life and property in a controlled manner. So we've uh, since hired a consultant and will be implementing uh, well, not implementing, but developing a plan to uh, perhaps ready our <coughs> citizens in a fashion that they'll be more prepared and that we'll be more prepared to have a plan in action for this. So again, thank you, and we hope that you have a uh, productive meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Darrell Gissel coming, we now have a floor. Welcome. Right, so we're going to move to the approval of the minutes, and then we're going to move to an action item, um, the public comment, because I understand we have some people who need to leave um, a little bit early. Everybody's okay with that. So let's, um, can I have a motion to approve the, let's just do both, the August and September, okay, <laughs> made by Adam Knapp, seconded by Bradbury. Bradbury. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Motion is carried. All right, so can I ask Pat um, Forbes, the Executive Director for the Louisiana Office of Community Development, to come up and um, talk to the action item that we have, the one restore the Louisiana Rental Program recommendation. And after that, if you have uh, public comments, 
Portia is over there with the uh, cards, stand up Portia, with cards, and then uh, you can uh, approach her and uh, we will address uh, any comments that you may have. Thank you, Pat. Here we go. Thank you very much. If you will um, go to slide 17 in your presentation. <clears throat> You also have in your, I think it's tab six, you have a summary that we provided to you earlier in the week on this recommendation. And, uh, and we will go through the recommendation now. We also have a resolution in your binder, uh, tab seven, for this resolution. In essence, um, we have played out the, the rental housing programs. As we've talked about many times before with you, uh, we had a shortage of affordable rental housing in the state before the floods. It got exacerbated by the floods. Um, we did, we allocated funds in the best uh, estimate that we had to get money into the best programs that we could. We've gotten to a point now after having extended uh, deadlines on two different programs, the, the multifamily rental program and the neighborhood landlord program, that the neighborhood landlord program is slightly oversubscribed and the multifamily program is dramatically undersubscribed. I think we have some 19 million in applications uh, for that program. So what we are proposing to you today is that we take some funds from the multifamily program, enough to cover all the applications we have now for our neighborhood uh, landlord program, and move the rest into the as yet unimplemented uh, piggyback program. Piggyback program we held until the end because it does take longer to implement. We were hoping to get more money out through these other two programs, but where we are right now, our recommendation is that the funds go into piggyback, the funds that are left over from multi-rental. It is easily the uh, best bang for the buck in terms of dollars of subsidy per affordable month of all the programs. It lasts for 30 to 35 years. It creates some great opportunities for long-term affordable rental properties. It just takes a little longer to develop. We had some great conversations with some of you this week about the recommendation. Mr. Knapp talked about what we did in Katrina Rita, which was <coughs> income housing with piggyback funds. I appreciate all the conversation that we had, and we are going to this resolution that, that we're going to uh, ask you to pass today doesn't tie us down to restrictions that wouldn't allow us to do that. So we can continue to explore the possibility of mixed income uh, and any other suggestions that we get from the task force as we go forward. Uh, today's action simply gets the money moved over there and lets us start the process of figuring out how to get it into a, a QAP at Louisiana Housing Corporation that's efficient and lets us get the money invested in affordable housing where it's needed. We know that um, there are rural, there are urban areas impacted by these floods and we have to be able to get the money out and the rental units out to all those. And so we'll take all those things into consideration as we figure out how to implement that. And Mr. Robbie Bizot knows way more about this than I do. If any of you have additional questions, details. Yes. Uh, hearing none, do we have any public comments? Any questions from the public? So the staff has made a recommendation on the rental programs. Uh, can I have a motion to? I'm sorry. Do the vote. Okay. You want to do the count? Okay. Mr. Bradbury. Here. Four. 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 <laughs> Mr. Gissel? Four. Representative James? Four. Mr. Knapp? Yes. Four. Mayor Norris? Yes. Mr. Olivier? Yes. Representative Pope? Four. Mayor Tyler? Support. Dr. Wilson? Support. Ms. Wyatt? Four. 
Eleven members have approved the resolution. It is passed, Madam Chair. Uh, so why don't, Pat, do you want to just finish?
again, we covered this last month, but I want to go over it again. It's super important, especially uh, remembering what I said earlier, which is uh, that many folks, the vast majority of folks, have done a lot of work and are continuing to work on their homes. So the extension that we got from HUD allows us to continue to reimburse people for work done after this past September 8th, all the way through next September 8th. Had that deadline stuff, we would not be able to reimburse people for any work they did after September 8th. And imagine the logistics of trying to figure out when work was done. So that was a, a big win for us. Um, again, you heard about this last meeting, but I'm going to go over again. It's super important. Based on number of respondents and our average cost of repair, we were able to bump reimbursements from 25% up to 50%. And most importantly, in my mind, we were able to bump for phases two through five, I mean, three through five, bump the prospective construction costs from 50% to 100%, which means there, we will not leave anybody out there because they couldn't come up with the other 50%. It's critical for neighborhoods and communities, and we we're glad we were able to make that move. Um, we also, as you know, expanded to include homeowners who have flood insurance but still have remaining unmet needs after the proceeds of that insurance and whatever FEMA assistance they got. Um, Governor Edwards has been continuing to fight for the state and for flooded residents. Um, he's just gotten back from D.C. yesterday. He had written, you have a letter in your binders that he wrote to the president. Uh, he's been continuing to work with the congressional delegation to make sure that we get what we need, uh, most specifically and most recently. He has implored Congress and the congressional delegation. I've heard them speaking this week about continuing to push for this SBA change. It is, as you all know, the, uh, do, the, the assessment of SBA and HUD and FEMA that SBA loans are a duplication of benefits with our grants. Consequently, we have to subtract every penny that, is, that somebody is approved for, even if they didn't draw the funds. If they got approved for an amount of money in an SBA loan, we have to count that as a duplication of benefits. It's ludicrous, it is ridiculous, and the congressional delegation and the governor are focused on trying to change that, and they are working with delegations from Texas and Florida who now face the same specter of uh, a ridiculous federal rule so there's some growing support for fixing that. I always say it's important to remember if we get that fixed, which I hope that we do, we also need another billion dollars to help those folks who have gotten SBA loans to cover that amount of money. Um, speaking of Florida and Texas, we have had, um, as soon as Harvey hit, uh, shortly thereafter, we started seeing a loss of some of the skill sets that we needed for our recovery, uh, most particularly the folks who do home inspections and essentially adjusters, insurance adjusters, people who can go assess the value of work that has been done and needs to be done. That's a critical early part of our process, and uh, it helped. it's the way that we establish the scope of work right now, and uh, it has drained some of the resources. We've taken a lot of steps. The governor was adamant that we'd be very aggressive in making sure that those other disasters not adversely impact our recovery. We've taken several steps. IAM, our, our contractor, has uh, ramped up hiring other subcontractors and more um, inspectors within their ranks, within their company. We have put out a, a solicitation for offers, which we made awards yesterday to two companies for those same services so that we can bring the, the skills in through some other paths. <clears throat> we have worked with the Louisiana Workforce Commission in developing a training program 
for people right here in Louisiana. This can be a boon not only for us and our program now, but for the state and for these folks just in terms of job training going forward. Um, and we also have started conversations with HUD about alternative ways to establish the scope of work that require less of this skill set to accomplish it. That is looking at sort of model homes for different sizes and trying to figure out if we can get to a fairly tight range on what those costs would be so that we wouldn't have to go in and do that detailed adjusting uh, project for every single house. They seem very receptive. They understand that they face a huge challenge in Florida and Texas with the number of houses they're going to have to do this for. So um, we expect to be getting them some, some follow-up data to their questions next week to support the idea, and uh, we will hopefully be updating you next meeting about the success of that. Key program stats, uh, 45,000 homeowners uh, have completed the survey. Um, nearly 38,000 of those qualified for phases one through six. That is to say, the information we have from the survey so far would indicate that they're going to be eligible for a grant from us. Um, 30, nearly 37,000 environmental reviews. Um, the numbers in your slide, 2,060 homeowners, is now at uh, over 2,200. And the total grant award acknowledgments is now over 67 million. I want to remind you that at our last task force meeting, that number was 18 million. So the, the speed is going up. Again, we're not where we all know we need to be, we're certainly not where we want to be, but we are starting to see, uh, in essence, you saw the eight-step process. We've got to move this product through the pipeline, and we are finally getting near the end of the pipeline. Our uh, closings have also gone up some 400% since our last meeting, as have the housing starts. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think we have over 300 uh, homeowners now who have closed and are in the process of starting construction. So that's been encouraging. Dr. Oswald, <coughs> Dr. Oswald. Yeah, can you explain what a uh, grant award acknowledgement is? It says over 2,200. That's not exactly receiving the check, is it? It's just that they're going to get a certain amount? That's correct. In essence, it puts it in the homeowner's court now to come in and do their closing and move forward to construction. Okay, so how long before they get the check, actually get the check? On so, average. Okay, let's say the, the homeowner gets their um, award acknowledgement letter today, and tomorrow they come in and say, or they schedule a closing for two days out and say, I want to close on solution one, which means they're going to use the state's program contractor to do the work. They could come in, do the closing, and Jeff, jump up here and tell me if I get anything wrong, but they could come in and do the closing, and as soon as they do the closing, we would assign the uh, job to a, a contractor who would start within a week. They, if, assuming they had done some reimbursement, I mean, uh, eligible work already, they would get that reimbursement check within about two weeks. So they would get funds actual money to them for the work they've completed. It takes about two weeks. We've got to go to the closing, uh, get through, back through all the information, and then send a check. So once, once they've been acknowledged, they do their, their expeditions and they're in their part, and we can do a check. Yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you very much. Just additional question on that. Can you break down for the 2200 which solutions they're choosing, uh, if you're seeing any patterns. We, we had a lot of discussion in the design conversations about whether the, the state-run program or the, the homeowners selecting their own contract was going to be more preferential, how many reimbursements from there. So that was the first. The second is, based on the pace change, is it, is it enough that we can now make any sort of estimates of the rate of improvement we would expect to see over the coming months uh, in the trying to, trying to I, I, I would say that we're, we're not quite at, at the pace we want to be at. We, we, we've hit some good numbers for a couple of weeks and staggered as well. And so we're making sure, I want to make sure that 
we don't set enough a, a ceiling that we could actually go beyond before we start doing those numbers. But yeah, I would say that in a fairly short period of time, we should be able to start predicting for folks how far out before we get to them who are in the later phases. Um, your first question, when we designed, we expected about 15, maybe 20% uh, to take solution one, that is the state run program. We're actually seeing closer right now up to 2730 range, but remember that so far that's mostly solution, I mean, uh, phase one and two who were low to moderate income elderly, the folks who may be less likely to want to go deal with their own contractor and all that. So we're sort of guessing right now that probably we'll wind up around 25% solution one, 75 solution two, and that's excluding the folks who are just going to be reimbursement. One more question, Madam Chair. Uh, on the, on the, it looks like about 8,000 that haven't uh, qualified for phases one through six. Are you seeing that? Can you oh, tell yeah. Us a little bit about those? Sorry, sure. So um, we ask everybody to fill out the survey. Any homeowner who flooded to fill out the survey, there, of course, are eligibility requirements. You have to have uh, lived in the place when it flooded. You have to have it was, had to be your primary residence. You had to be the owner. Um, we have, you had to have had major severe damage, that is in most cases over a foot of water. So we have a lot of people who had what FEMA deemed minor damage, less than a foot of water. So we asked them to fill out the survey. They did fill out the survey, but when we look in there, they check the box that says six inches of water. We can go out and do the inspection and maybe see if they're, it, they, they guess they, they said that wrong, but it's it's mostly people who had minor damage.
skill set, and that can take two, three hours in, in the house. They will schedule those ahead of time. They'll let people know that it's going to take a, a, a while and schedule it when it's convenient for the homeowner. The third one, which only occurs for homes that are older than 1978, built before 1978, is a lead inspection. We've got to go in and test for lead-based paint, make sure that uh, if there is any there, we add the remediation of that to the scope of work, which we pay for, but that's the third reason. That's ideally. There, we know that we have had some situations where the first uh, scope work inspector didn't get the job right and had to go back. That's not all that common, but we certainly acknowledge there have been a few of those and where we were working to make sure that that gets less and less and less uh, uh, likely to happen. Um, it will become even less likely if we can get this agreement with HUD about our alternative way to do the scope of work. We will still have to do an inspection, but it's much shorter much simpler, much less prone to error. So those are the three times that we should be in the house. At the house, right? And, and each one of these skill sets, each one of these people that come out, groups of people that come out, the environment, if there's a delay to one site inspection, that wasn't right. Well, obviously, you just know that it didn't have to be any communication between the homeowner and the environment. Side inspection and the third step that you gave us, there would be a time lapse. Is that correct? After there could be. In fact, the, the, the lead inspection could occur first. We don't care which one of those happens first. They all have to come together with that, the other work that I was telling you about earlier the verification of benefits, the income, did you live there, all those kind of things. Those three pieces have to come together and then we go to grant. I'm going to put Chase back and I'm going to put Chase back. The bottom line is that when you still use the engine example, you will. My frustration or, or okay, my frustration would be as a homeowner is that once that environmental is done, site inspection is done, then it is time, uh, there's a tremendous time out, and there's no communication between the homeowner that when that's going to happen. Yes. Your office, we've got several calls from my office in the last couple of weeks in reference to this. Why I'm bringing it up? Yes. Nobody's called to understand. Uh, unless maybe we could get something with a contractor to work out. I don't know if we can put teams together or something before they go out there. But they're getting these multiple visits, and I guess they're not getting any follow up. And I'm not throwing stones, I'm just asking questions. You bet. So that's a great question. There are a couple of different pieces to the answer for that. One is, we are trying to manage uh, the invitations to apply so that we can also have the inspector there and then have the follow-up, the additional work that has to happen, happen in fairly short order after that inspection. Um, with respect to, we're, and we're still balancing those pieces. As we as we get the speed up, we've got to get all these concurrent pieces at the same speed at the same time. So that's one of the challenges that creates this gap between the inspection and the uh, award acknowledgement. That's the piece we're trying to shorten because the inspection should happen fairly shortly after a person applies. Um, the other piece is the communication part, and we acknowledge that we uh, uh, were under communicating to folks, and that just leads people to wonder, do they still have my application, do they lose my information? And so we now communicate on a monthly basis with everybody who's in the system to say, this is where you are, or this is how you're, where you've changed in the process, and uh, we expect to it to be X amount of time before you progress to the next step, and either we will be reaching out to you, or it may say you should be reaching back out to us when you have these things, but we're communicating at least monthly, and Nick helped me. There are also some 
uh, weekly communications that we're doing in some cases. So yeah. we, we've acknowledged that and, and recognize it's, it's a problem for folks to sit and, and not know what they are. That communication, is that with all people that have filled out a survey and have a response letter? Or is that just for those that have had? People who have filled out the survey get something monthly that says, you're still in phase five, what have you. Uh, people who have applied will will get uh, other information about where they are in the process. And that comes from your office, or is that coming from? It's coming from the program, from the Restore yeah. program. And it goes out. We're, we, we know that we've got some folks who don't get email. We get about 60% of our emails get read. We also do in hard copy mailers to folks, and in some cases texting, and we do call out. That may be something we need to look at. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, Ted? I don't know if I should yield to the guy that you're the CEO. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you're changing the <laughs> command. Have you started yet? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm going to keep going. All right. Uh, I, I have a few concerns, Pat. Um, and um, so, and, and thank you for, for the, the edification of the group. Um, I had a, a meeting in my district, and Pat, Nick, most of the folks you see here attended, and they were able to to um, hear some of the concerns that, that I've been hearing uh, for the past few months and of course time that we all agree that it's taken too slow, but the SBA issues, uh, I'm glad to hear um, that they were making some traction there um, with our congressional delegation. Um, one of the things folks were confused, and, and maybe I was confused because I didn't, the breakdown that folks can be eligible for both a portion of, well, solution one and two and reimbursement, right? <coughs> Um, has that been communicated um, fully to folks? Because I don't want folks applying for certain things and missing out on it. They, they won't miss out on it. Okay. We, 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 when we go to the house, the, the inspector goes to the house and says, I mean, we can look around obviously and see if, even if they all they've done is gutted it, we've got a line item for gutting, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to add that, that, that automatically <coughs> result in a reimbursement. And so from there, it just builds whatever other work they've done will be a reimbursement. The only choice they're asked is like solution one or two. If they've checked on the box, I still have work to do. Okay. We'll, we'll assess the three part of that. Yeah. All right, so I, I, I got a text message from someone else and, I, and I need to understand it. So his line items like reimbursement estimate with overhead is 80,000 plus. Total DOB, that's duplication of benefit, 26 plus. And then he has total eligible reimbursement award, 54 plus, and then total reimbursement award, 27 plus. Right. So I'm, I'm confused. Um, I get that the first, the 80 minus the 26 to the total eligible reimbursement award of 54 plus. So what, what's the second number, the total reimbursement award? Is, it, is his total eligible reimbursement award subtracted again for the total reimbursement award? Solutions three through six, we only pay 50% reimbursement. Gotcha. So that's the 27 is half of 54. And that's based on his uh, in, income his, and age. In, income and age, yeah. okay. So he's about my age, so he, he, okay, 50%. Okay, gotcha. All right, so the, the other piece, and it goes back to, to something that Adam mentioned about us being able to, to track how you how we're progressing with um, making disbursements. Um, I requested some, some information, and I think that it's information that, that we should um, get, and I'm gonna request that, that we get this, the total group get this information on, on every meeting. Um, I, I wanted to know um, for the members how much, how many awards has have we dispersed in solution one. I wanted to know what has gone on solution two and solution three. Um, and I would like for, for the, the entire board to get that information um, because for me, um, I was hearing that a lot of folks in my district, most of the people that I knew that had received awards were all reimbursed. Um, and while I was excited for those folks, I know that a lot of those people either had insurance or had resources to go out there and make some things happen. So I was concerned about the other folks that didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, and also recognizing that there's some, some crossover because we have folks in Solution 1 and also receive reimbursement. Um, but I'm going to request that, that we get that information um, at every meeting per parish, if you guys can break that down. Absolutely. What, what I would 
be glad to do and suggest is maybe we provide the task force with a weekly update on all, all the uh, main statistics, how much, how many awards, how much money, how many uh, disbursements, all those things. We, we can certainly do that. Okay, and the, my, my last thing, um, the, the folks exactly. that, to be clear, uh, Jeff just reminded me that's in a pipeline report that's actually online. That it's online. Everybody, including the public, can look at every day. And it gets broken it down. It gets updated okay. weekly. Okay. All right. And so, solutions versus application. I mean, surveys versus application. Surveys submitted, there are, before my folks can submit an application, they have to be invited to submit an application. Correct. That's correct. Okay. And so the gap between those folks and is that those are the, the folks that you communicated. You guys are starting to update them on a monthly basis, so they don't know where they stand. We're actually updating everybody who uh, has filled out the survey on some level or another. Some folks will get letters that say uh, we've determined that you're not eligible either because and give the reason you had minor damage which gives them, and it says you have a chance to appeal. So you can come in and say, wait, I did have a flood of water. FEMA got this wrong. So we can go through that process. Um, those folks, once they get that letter, won't continue to get updates because they would have been determined to be ineligible or, or uh, zero award. So we wouldn't, that's the only group of folks we wouldn't continue to communicate with through their closing. Gotcha. All right, one more last question. Um, the the 18,000 or so folks that we know were approved for SBA loans, you said that that would be another possible billion dollars to help, and that's at 50% at or that's just the, the total amount of what they were uh, awarded? That's the total amount they were awarded. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Madam Chair. One thing you said that I want to make sure, just because we get a lot of questions about this, you said some of the folks you saw got money had insurance and that's that is not that should not actually not 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 okay even though we it, we've uh opened it up to folks who had insurance we've not invited those folks to apply yet okay Darryl, did you still? And it, i think you said there were eight thousand people that were approved and two thousand that had closed what's been the biggest impediment to getting them closed i don't think we're at two thousand
low-income housing tax credits, which helps us leverage both the tax credits and private loan funds so we can get more units and in many cases uh, can, I mean, one of the options is to do uh, <coughs> mixed income developments as well. Um, we also have in our rental programs rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. These numbers have gone up about 50%. I'm sorry, I have the numbers and I, I don't have them with you right now. Since our last meeting, they're both still on pace to be fully implemented and expanded uh, next year. Small business loan program. We uh, met with the uh, working group of your membership on economic development uh, last week to talk through this program and any sort of some options to consider. Um, it's still undersubscribed. We've got some great suggestions from the working group members um, for implementing some changes as well as from the Bankers Association a couple of months ago, a meeting that we went to. Thank you, Lissandra. Um, a, a, a few different changes. Um, one is increasing the forgivable portion. If you recall, it's a 20%, it's a, it's a loan program with 20% forgivable. Uh, the recommendation and what we're planning to do is to increase that forgivable portion up to 40%. We have a lot of folks, we've heard from a lot of folks, but it's just too much debt to take on. Um, so that's one of the moves we're going to be taking. We, we are also going to start working through chambers, local chambers of commerce and other business groups, uh, not only to continue to get the word out to small businesses, but also to perhaps work as uh, technical assistance for small businesses because we've got a technical assistance program right now and it's been underprescribed. And so we're looking for ways to spend that money, make it benefit small businesses and help the economy get back going and get those jobs created. So we're continuing to look at ways to uh, modify the, the uh, program. with the municipalities, with the nonprofits, local governments, 
um, to make sure that they are aware of the things they need to do. We still have an outstanding question with HUD and um, the Department of Labor at the federal level about instituting uh, when Davis-Bacon and related acts kicks in on these projects. We've been advising all the local governments to put Davis-Bacon in their contracts because we don't know the answer to this yet. But as soon as we can get this answer, and we expect it very soon, they keep telling us, in fact, we may get it today. And they also told us to expect a favorable answer, but we do not yet have that answer. And so uh, we'll be able to update you on that next time. But you know, that should make it easier for us to help uh, those governments who got damaged, got to work, started fixing their property, and then found out they could get money from us. So um, we're, we're Seeing the talk about the match uh, has reminded me of something I was going to ask you about maybe after the meeting on the buyout programs. 75% of the market value on buyouts, and I know this is a different uh, pot of money in a different agency. Is there any chance that any of this money could be used to cover the 25% in this town on the market value of homes? That, that's a, impediment to anybody that's considered a buyer. Right. Uh, yes, sir. One, we have not budgeted any money for HM. You're talking about the hazard right. mitigation program, yeah. hazard mitigation grant program. We have not budgeted any money for the match for HM to date. The governor has been asking for $600 million in infrastructure enhancement funds, <laughs> which we have not gotten adequate funding to be able to do that yet. If we do, I would expect that match would be a very viable uh, use of some of those funds. Um, we have used CDBG funds in the past after Isaac for uh, the 25% HM match for low to moderate income families who, as you said, could never come up with that uh, gap to be able to either take a buyout or get their home elevated. So it is a it is a viable use of CDBG funds. We don't have it budgeted right now, but it's certainly possible if we get additional funds or if we wind up using less <coughs> of this money for FEMA public assistance match. Well, I don't want that money to go. I mean, we've got a pretty nice allocation in our town for buyouts of repetitive flood loss property size. But that's what they run up against is I'm getting 75%. Yes, sir. Requirements for the site-specific environmental review process. 
on repaired homes following a disaster. And finally, the governor urged consideration of a global match concept on FEMA public assistance projects to allow local, state, and or CDBG funds to provide the non-federal match, which is 10 to 25 percent, in a more cost-effective and time-efficient manner. I also want to talk about the governor's efforts as it relates to rebuilding whole communities, and specifically as it relates to the Con Acre subdivision. This is a subdivision of Coin Capi Parish. It is a predominantly African American low income community that consists of two streets and new roads. This community has experienced severe repetitive flooding over roughly 20 years. In fact, the area flooded again this past Sunday when 14 inches of rain fell. Numerous meetings have been held over the past several months to develop options that would be available to assist these homeowners to relocate to an area outside of the floodplain. We have engaged a number of key stakeholders in this effort, including the Point for P Parish Government, GOSEP, um, OCD, Louisiana Housing Corporation, the LSU School of Architecture, the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and Congressman Garrett Graves. Now, the key component to this relocation project is based on the NRS, NRCS buyout program that is being offered to each of these homeowners. The program would require that all of the homeowners participate in the buyout, and it does appear at this time that we do have 100% participation in that program. The parish has identified a few potential sites outside the floodplain that could be used to relocate all of the homeowners. Now, there's going to likely be a gap between the potential NRCS appraisal amount and funding that will be needed to get homeowners back into comparable living conditions outside the floodplain. One potential solution to closing this gap is funding from the Restore Homeowner Program for those homeowners who would be eligible. In addition, the third action plan for CDBG funding from the 2016 floods allocates additional funding to address the gap through acquisition and infrastructure. The funding was approved by the task force at the June meeting. The concept is that CDBG funding would be used to augment the NRCS funding to place a homeowner in a structure that's similar to their current resident in Pecan Acres. At this time, uh, homeowners are being asked to complete that application process with the assistance of a parish, which could take about 12 to 18 months to fully complete the full process. And finally, we just want to applaud the work of you, the task force, and also Pat Forbes at his shop in terms of advancing and ramping up the effort to get homeowners back in their homes. We talked about it before in terms of where we're at last month versus this month, and I do just want to reiterate those numbers. Last month, we were at 600 homeowner awards and $18 million. Today, we're at over 2,200 grant awards and $67.5 million. And as Pat said, as you've all articulated, of course, this is not soon enough, but we're working as fast as we can again to ramp up these efforts, given the fact that we know that we have other disasters in Florida and Texas and Puerto Rico, and that's been a strain on our resources in terms of inspectors. But certainly with the new SFO and bringing new contractors on board to help the inspection process, we want to continue that path in terms of increased access to the award a program and getting people back into their homes. So that's our update for today. Great, thank you. Any questions for Aaron? Okay. All right, thank you. So now we come to our public comments. Do we have any?
no further IRA distributions after August 2017. I provided a copy of the actual August statement and the September statement indicating that no further income had been received. These are uploaded in the system. I received my award notification on October the 18th. In spite of following the instructions given to me by Mr. Ford's and his assistant, my award was based on the 2016 income and not 2017. I, I, I brought all of this to their attention on October the 19th. I submitted a copy of this letter to them also on October 19th. One of their people, Mr. Clark Grant, advised me not to file an appeal because he would check on this matter for me. As of today, I've heard nothing. I have talked to the ladies out front, and Ms. Heather has sent an email to someone on the task force asking them to change my income to reflect what 2017's income is. My question now is, if that happens, when will I receive my award?